What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be building a PC that you can actually buy in 2021. In this video I'm going to talk you through all the parts I chose and why, just how I did it for this build and how you can do it too with the components we've chosen. Some of the part choices are a little bit creative but bear with us as we put this system together before booting it up a little bit later, benchmarking it and seeing just how well it performs. Let's dive into it though after a quick word from today's video sponsor. Corsair's new IQ5000X chassis puts your system on display front and centre. With three RGB fans up front, great water cooling support and even room for a 360mm rad beside the motherboard tray. Stacks of cable management room and a door at the back to keep drives and cables tidy makes it easy for you to put your system, not your cables, front and centre. It's also available in a mesh airflow variant and you can learn more at the links below. We're going to kick this build off with our motherboard. This is the Gigabyte B450M S2. To H, but basically you want any budget Gigabyte B450 motherboard. Motherboard stock is not looking too bad at the moment and while B550 is now with us, this B450 board is a cheaper, better value alternative for a build like the one we're putting together. You can see the motherboard here with its pretty basic but essential features. You've got a couple of RAM dim slots, four would be nice but two are better value. The AM4 CPU socket, of course, room for our graphics card, an M.2 drive, as well as a pretty solid rear I.O. with a couple of USB 3 ports, which basically is all we need. We're going to go ahead and use the included motherboard backplate that comes in the box with your motherboard. Pop this through the four holes before we then go ahead and install the CPU and the cooler. Talking of the CPU, this is the AMD Ryzen 3 3100. But for this build, you've got plenty of options. You can go for the 3100 or the 3300X, or if you're struggling for stock of those, you can go for a first gen Ryzen chip like the 1600X. So you've got plenty of options, both new and used. Installing the CPU in this build Build's very easy. Simply find the gold triangle on the processor, line this up with the top left corner of your motherboard's CPU socket. There we go, and the processor drops very nicely into place. Typically, your included CPU cooler that comes with the processor will have thermal paste pre-applied, but because we've reused this cooler, we just need to pop uh, a dab of fresh thermal paste on to make sure the link between the CPU and the cooler really is the best it can be. There we go, that'll do. Not too much, don't go overboard. Before going ahead and simply placing the cooler through those four backplate holes on your motherboard. Tighten it up in a cross pattern, kind of diagonally to spread the load of the cooler, and then we're good to go. With the motherboard, CPU, and CPU cooler ticked off our list, next up today is the RAM. Any 8 gigabyte budget kit is pretty good going for this build. You want 3600 megahertz speed, and you want two DIMMs for dual channel performance. This Kingston HyperX RGB kit's a bit overkill, but as I say, keep it simple, two 4 gig DIMMs, and you're good to go in a budget build like this. To install your RAM, you simply want to pull back the clips on each of the RAM DIMM slots, align up the notch on your memory with the corresponding notch on the slot itself, and then go ahead and simply slide both DIMMs into place. There's our first DIMM, and there's our second DIMM, and the motherboard assembly, as we're gonna call it, is basically complete. With the motherboard assembly complete, next up, it's time to install it into our case today. And this might well be the lightest PC case I have ever used. This comes from Aerocool, who are known for their budget-oriented, really high-value chassis. And this is Aerocool's new Quantum Mesh. With a mesh panel up front, three included 120mm addressable RGB fans, and a tempered glass side panel, which we'll install here a little bit later. It might be quite a light case with quite thin kind of metals and stuff, but it is super, super cheap, which helps with the whole kind of budget theme of today's build, right? It's always a good idea with any case to take off any of the pre-installed side panels as soon as you get the case out the box. That's going to make the chassis whoopsie daisy and that's going to make the case a lot easier to work with today. The next stage of the build is to go ahead and move our motherboard into the case. There's a couple of things you need to do before you go all gung-ho and screw it in and that's just to make sure that through each of the holes on our motherboard there's a corresponding standoff installed in the case. So we can see here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six motherboard holes which correlate to one, two, three, four, five, six holes 
through a motherboard. Make sure you install this before the motherboard goes into the case, put in these circular audio ports at the bottom. And this snaps into this kind of rear cutout of the case, nice and easily, a little something like this. The motherboard then slots into the case and through the rear IO shield and is screwed in through the six screw hole locations we referenced just a moment ago. Cool, with that done, I'm gonna talk about our graphics card choice for today's build and how you can get your hands on a GPU in 2021 before we round off our components a bit later with our SSD and then of course our power supply. This is the Zotac GTX 1650 and while 1650 prices are a bit inflated at the moment, you're gonna have a lot more luck on both the new and the used markets. Try to pick up something like this. A quick browse of eBay, both here in the UK and over in the States shows there are some 1650 deals to be had, at least a lot more deals on 1650s than there are on say a 2060 or even a 3060, right? You are not getting your hands on one of those. This is a really great card though for 1080p medium settings gaming at 60 to 100 plus frames per second. And I think picking something like this up for 150, maximum 200 US dollars is actually Actually not such a terrible idea. I actually think the 1650 is a great stopgap GPU as well. If you really want to get into PC gaming right now, I think buying a 2060 for like 800 US dollars or something crazy is not a very sensible idea because when GPU stock does get back to normal, although that looks like it's going to take a long time yet, when you come to sell that card at normal market pricing, you're going to lose basically all of your money. At least with something like this, when price is normalized, they should still be selling for 70, 80, 90 plus dollars on the second hand market, which means you could pick up something like this and it only cost you $100 if you only kept it for something like a year, which is a lot better than losing $600 on a 2060. Obviously, it's not ideal, but I I think you'll be really pleasantly surprised by the performance of a 1650. Also, the lack of any extra power connector or anything like that means if you wanted to upgrade like a Dell Optiplex or something like that and use that as a stopgap for gaming, then this is also a really, really solid choice. Installing the GPU is pretty easy. We need to just remove the PCIe bracket cover at the back of our chassis today to allow the graphics card to be installed and then line up the gold notch on our graphics card with the corresponding gold PCIe slot on the motherboard. The graphics card then slides very nicely into place and secures down nice and easily. I can't believe how small the 1650 is. It's like a mini GPU, but it really is a pocket rocket. I think you're gonna be surprised a little bit later, so hold out for that. The next thing we need to do today is install our power supply and do some of our cables and our wiring. The graphics card doesn't need any power, which makes our GPU super, super easy easy, but we do need to install some motherboard and some CPU power. And for that, I've picked up this 80 plus bronze unit from Aerocool. This is a 600 watt power supply, which means not only is it hugely overkill for today's build, but will support something like a 3060 or a 2060 or a 2060 super when GPU stock and pricing gets a bit more normal. And the fact it's got all black cables as well is gonna really help our build aesthetic. In today's case, we just need to pull the pre-installed cables and wires out the way for a moment. And we're gonna go through what they are and what they do a bit later to slide the power supply in. It's just gonna slot through the back of the case and then secure down in these four separate screw hole locations. The motherboard power cable is the largest of the bunch and just plugs into the right hand side of the motherboard nice and easily. Your CPU power cable is next up and this goes to the top left of the motherboard. Once again, super easily. There is a right and a wrong way around to do this. So if it doesn't go in first time, don't force it and you'll be all right. Once those power cables are in, all we then need to do is just pop in our front panel connectors today. So we've got the largest of the bunch, first of all, which is our USB 3 cable. This is notched and only goes in one way around and the pins on your motherboard can be a bit delicate. Next up, you've got your USB 2.0 header that powers the USB 2 port on the top of the case, which is nice to see in addition to USB 3. And that's followed closely by the HD audio connector. This is for our headphone and mic jacks and all that good stuff and goes to the bottom left of the motherboard. There's a pin missing and blocked out. So once again, only goes in one way round. There's a bit of a theme to this. And then finally, we've got our JFP1 connectors, which are actually like a bunch of little pins. Uh, and these do your power switch, your reset button, your hard drive indicator LED, all that good stuff. And they go around the bottom right-hand side of the motherboard. I'll pop the diagram on your screen now to make this a bit 
easier to follow along with. But once they're done, our cables and wiring today are pretty much wrapped up. And with that, we've got one more component to install into our build before the actual build process is pretty much done. This is the Kingston A400. It's a great value drive. A 500 gigabyte or one terabyte capacity is gonna be an awesome choice. But I think an SSD is definitely the way you want to go in 2021. I think there's only one thing we need to do though before we actually see just how good uh, this system performs and that's plug it in. So let's find a power cable. The RAM's lighting up. Here we go. Let's hit the power button. Oh yeah, look at that thing. Mate, that's awesome. Those fans are epic. I mean, this case, considering the price point is, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Cool. And I think that only leaves one thing for it. Let's test out how well this system performs in a load of the latest and most popular titles, but first an epic glam montage of just how good it looks when it's all powered up. Roll the montage. <laughs> Right then, now we've put this system together, booted it up and seen just how good it looks when it's all powered up. Let's take a dive and see exactly how it performs. On your screen now is a summary of all the different gaming benchmarks uh, that we tested today and we are going to take a deeper dive into some individual focus titles in just a second. In the card section now, you can find a playlist with the full unedited gaming benchmark runs on our new benchmarking channel called Benched. So check that out, go and subscribe over there, but let's first kick things off with GTA 5. At 1080p high settings, we got 94, 86 and 74 for the average 90 and 99th percentile results. The 1650 is a beast of a budget GPU and with anti-aliasing and some of your textures tuned down, you really can get some very impressive frame rates. We also tested the likes of Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War at 1080p low settings here and we got 64, 56 and 53 frames per second. This is still over 60 frames per second at 1080p and although it's low settings, visually, as you can see, the game looked pretty fantastic. Valorant is a really, really great game for a card like this. 1080p high settings gave us 242 FPS on average. It looked fantastic, it played really, really well, and we'd absolutely recommend it. We also tested out Cyberpunk, as that's quite a popular game at the minute, and unfortunately, as good as the 1650 is on the budget end, Cyberpunk kills it. 1080p low settings around 34 FPS on average. You are going to have to tune down to 720p to get some playable frame rates here, but it's just a shame that Cyberpunk is so poorly optimised. Fortnite, on the other hand, we tested that at both 1080p high and then 1080p competitive pro settings. First off at high settings, we got 64 FPS with 57 and 52 for the 90 and 99th percentile results, but tune in to competitive settings with our render distance set to far and everything down on low, we got 139 frames per second on average. A really, really fantastic result here. We also tested COD Warzone and got some great results. 68, 63 and 61, meaning you're always playing above that crucial 60 FPS mark. Overwatch and CSGO then are our two final test titles today. Overwatch at 1080p high settings gave us 111 frames per second on average with 106 and 101 for the 90 and 99th percentile results on high settings, while CSGO at similar settings gave us 211 FPS on average, which really is very, very impressive. This 1650 build is a bit of a pocket rocket. It's a small, compact, budget-oriented system that kills gaming at 1080p in 2021. If you're gonna build a system like this, if you've managed to get your hands on any of these components, let us know in the comments section down below. Subscribe to see more from us, but thank you very much for watching and hopefully we'll see you in the next one.